We're in a brand new series. Um, we're going to be going through the book of John from now all the way through, like past. Well, we've, we've told you that we're going to do this up to Easter. We lied. We're going to go up to Easter, and then um, the book of John records the death and resurrection of Jesus, but there's still material. There's like a, a couple of chapters after that, like a chapter and a half. And that stuff covers the 40 days after Jesus died, between when he died on the cross, between when he rose from the grave, and between when he ascended to heaven. And that 40 days, some amazing things happen. And so we're gonna call that series right after Easter 40, and we're just gonna be focusing on those 40 days. But up to that point, we're gonna be in the book of John leading up to the resurrection. So if you've got a Bible, if you could turn in it to, uh, first, or to John chapter one, verses 35 to 51. If you don't have a Bible, feel free to go to your phone, um, you, uh, download a, a free Bible app. Those are cool. If you don't own a physical Bible, I wanna challenge you in this series, Get yourself a physical Bible and bring it and mark it up with questions and underlines and things that, are, that you're learning in this. I'm just going to maximize your understanding of the book of John. Um, feel free, if you don't own a Bible, to go to the Mission Merch area um, after the service. They've got Bibles over there. Pick one up. Um, we don't charge anything for the Bibles. Take it. There's also, this is just a secret between you and me, there's like a lost and found of Bibles um, next to the vending machine. If you don't like the Bibles that we're giving away for free, just take one of those. If it's got someone's name in it, just scratch it out. Put your name, that's fine. I won't tell them. But we, we, I want you to be maximizing your opportunity of getting in and seeing what God's doing in this book. Um, and some, for me, I'm a physical, I'm a visual learner. And so if having a physical Bible helps me just to, again, have scribbles and notes and drawings and stuff to help me track with what's going on. So I hope that that's helpful to you as well. Um, this book is written by John. Uh, this is not John the Baptist. This is uh, the, one of the youngest disciples that Jesus called. He's the guy that was so young that he probably would have needed a permission slip for most of the stuff that Jesus did as far as what he was doing on all these different like excursions and stuff. And he outlives all the other disciples. Like all the rest of them get killed off for Christianity. He doesn't. He gets imprisoned for his Christianity, but he's, he, because of the longevity, he not only is someone who is an eyewitness to what happened with Jesus's life, he records the gospel of John then he records three letters that we have um, that are to different churches, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, that's later on in the New Testament. And he's also the one that recorded the book of Revelation. So John's a pretty big deal, even though he was a young dude when he was, when he was called to be a disciple of Jesus. Big deal as far as our faith and someone who informs us who Jesus is. And so I'm so excited to jump into this. If you could stand as we read God's word, we'll start with verse 35 of chapter one in the book of John. The next day, John, and this is John the Baptist, not John the author here. The next day, John the, the baptizer was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You'll see even greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. 
All right, that's a huge section right there of, of passage and everything, but it's super important. Um, you might be wondering, why in the world did we start in verse 35? If we're going to be going through the book of John, the opening verses of John are pretty spectacular, and they are. But we covered a lot of that in the Let There Be Light series. Um, in the Let There Be Light series, it, it opens up with John and what, what Birgit said earlier today in, in worship. That John is saying, in the beginning, like before all of us, what was before all of us was God. And the word, talking about Jesus, was with God and the word was God. Here's the cool thing. Lots of the other gospels, they go into the nativity. Like they're looking at the manger, they're looking at the, at the, the wise men. John apparently is like, that's great, but I'm not, spending, I'm not spending any time on the wise men. I'm not gonna look at the shepherd. I don't care about a star. That stuff's all important, it's, but it's, other people have said it. I wanna get to the engineering all of this. I walked with this person. And the biggest reveal for me was not that like wise men saw a star. That's cool. It's important. But for me, the craziest thing was that I've grown up understanding this idea of God as invisible spirit. I get that. A lot of people get that. That's okay. I got that. There's an invisible God. He's spirit. And then there's this guy who's Jesus, who's physical. You could punch him. You could spit on him. You could eat with him. You could laugh with him. You could cry with him. You could watch him die. And for me to fuse together this, what I grew up understanding, and that, who I walked with, was a trip. And so for me to be able to bring those things together, that for me, I, I want to just jump into the crazy theological reality of that, even more than the manger, even more than the, the wise men. Let's talk about that. He was, he was with God from the beginning because he was God. That's the opening. That's, that's the, the preamble to this whole book. And the next thing we see is when Jesus starts to call disciples. Okay, and, and this is basically where people start following Jesus as a teacher. And in the Jewish faith, that was a big deal. And the, the thing that's important for us to understand is that John is, is talking about this massive thing as so massive and so intense that it's almost like he's saying, you should be asking hard questions about this. You shouldn't just swallow this reality. Oh yeah, God became man, that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. That makes zero sense. God created us, we're total jerks to him, and he loves us, so he became a human so that he could die and then rise again. That makes sense to you? Paul, in one of the letters to, to the Corinth says, that's a ludicrous message to anyone who hasn't accepted it already. So if you share your faith with someone and they're like, that sounds dumb, you should say, I know, the Bible agrees. Paul said the same thing, it sounds dumb. It just happens to be amazingly true. But, but the reality is we should be asking hard questions. The first hard question we should be asking, that should be demanding of Jesus is, is he for real? Like for real, for real. Not like in my heart, he's real, but not, I mean like, reality, scientifically, historically, I don't know. I mean, I, I like what he's teaching. He's got some good things to say. So spiritually speaking, I think that he, he could be real, but authentically real, legitimately real, I don't think so. And that's one thing that the Bible doesn't afford us the capacity to, to go with. We either have to say he's totally false or he's true. It's weird because it doesn't give us a, a it, the Bible demands us not just to have an emotional response. Like my faith in God is there because I feel him. Well, yeah, but you might not. My faith is there because I feel like God is just like so warm and, and I just, I, I, every moment I, I feel his presence. You might, but you might not. The, the scriptures talk about how we, we come to God and, and in fact, another passage says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, your intellect. If you're a Christian be emotionally, you'll be a Christian until your emotions run out. The Bible says you should be asking hard questions. Is he for real? Like for real, for real, for real, for real, really real. And we see that that's something that he's not squeamish about. If you go to the passage, we see it. The following day, this is in the New Living Translation. I just read out of the NIV. This is the NLT. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. How many disciples does John the Baptist have? Right here. There's more, but right here, how many do we have? Two. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Okay, so I don't know if you're big into losing followers, but John was. All right, if you lose followers, it's like one of those things you're like, oh, that's not good. I just lost followers to someone else. 
John's totally okay with it. Why? Because he's like, I'm not the Messiah. I am not the one that the whole Old Testament has been waiting for to be revealed to make all this redemption. I'm not him, but I'm confident that my cousin is. Jesus is the Lamb of God. So if I lose followers to Jesus, I'm cool with it. And he does. And one of these two followers is Andrew. Uh, Verse 37, when John's two disciples heard this, they followed, oh, let's go back. When John's two followers, well, there we go. When John's two followers heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he says, stop asking me questions. Don't you understand I'm a religious leader? Just believe. He doesn't say that. If a rabbi asks you to follow him, to invite you into their world, he's saying, I'm opening up the door for you to investigate me. Jesus is not squeamish of that question or any other question. He's not a just believe it. He's a come and see it type of person. He wants you to understand and ask the hard questions. And that may seem foreign to you if you grew up religious. If you grew up a lot of religion, Christianity and other religions, the kind of the, the motif is, the, or the MO is, that I really can't ask questions because if I ask questions, it reveals that I'm dumb or I'm a heretic or I'm someone who's like, just like my faith isn't, str- I, if, I, if I actually had strong faith, I wouldn't have a hard question like this. And that may be true religiously, but that is not true biblically of the biblical Jesus. He wants your questions. If you're someone today and you're here like, I I would not identify as a Christian. I'm I'm either an atheist or I'm an agnostic, but I'm here. I just want to tell you, I'm so glad you're here because this is a church where we want people that are coming that are not yet convinced as well, along with the people who are convinced so that they could do exactly what Jesus says. Come and see. Come and see. We want you to investigate this. I, I love it when, when someone comes up to me and they're like, man, look, I'm, I'm kind of getting to know this faith thing. I'm kind of okay with this Jesus thing, but I have questions. Like almost like they're saying, I want to give you a hug, but I've got COVID. <laughs> I'm just like, no, I, I, love, I love questions. This church loves questions. If you've got hard questions about the Bible, ask them. If you know a Christian that knows a little bit more than you, ask them. They may or may not have the answer. I may or may not have the answer. But what we want is we want you to be the type of people that are asking that question, is he for real? And here's the cool thing. Within this passage, we see like these indicators that not only is he open to that investigation, John is writing this to help give us the the, the foundation to know that this is true, that we can actually trust that that the account of Jesus is verifiable, that that is something that, that is an eyewitness account. It's, this is not something that's written like mythology. It's not something that's written like it's some fiction. How many of you um, in 2023, you read at least three fiction books? Okay, good. All right, awesome. I didn't, but you did, and that's great. Now, in modern fiction, one of the things that modern fiction does is it actually, the, the way that modern fiction is written for a Western mind is it includes key details. We love details. If you give us details, it's going to draw us into the story. That's not how ancient fiction was written. This um, guy who used to be, uh, he was the literature professor at Duke. His name was Rels Price. Uh, he passed away uh, just a little bit ago. But he, what, one of the things that he would talk about was when studying ancient literature and studying the Bible, you see that the New Testament is written radically different than literature of the time that was intended to be mythological, to ascribe to some type of deity, but it wasn't intended to be an eyewitness account. Like for, you know, you have stuff that's in here. Like, let's just take a look. I mean, keep it on this screen right here. Uh, he says, come and see. And then it says, it was what? It was about what? Four o'clock, okay? In the original Greek, it's the, at the 10th hour. Uh, the, at the 10th hour, and that means 4 p.m., that specificity that was indicative of something that is an eyewitness account, not mythology. In ancient mythology, you don't have like in Greek mythology, Zeus rising up and Zeus rose up and he fought the Titans right around four-ish. It doesn't happen because that, that was, that, it, you wrote literature one way, you wrote eyewitness historical accounts different. There's detail included in John's account from here all the way through that is an indicator that we have to ask the question, Okay, I can't say that this is mythology. I have to ask the question, do I believe this or not? Do I believe the eyewitness account of Jesus or not? And then go from there. Is he for real? But not only is he for real, is he shareable? Because you might be someone who does believe in Jesus, but you might say, I believe in Jesus. I've asked him to forgive my sins. I get that. I'm all about that. 
But as far as sharing that thing that someone gave to me with someone else, that's not me, man. I'm not equipped for that. I can't share that because I'm not there. I, I can't share it because I'm not equipped. Okay? Like, like I, I'm, I'm too young a Christian, or, or I'm, I'm an introvert, or, I, you know, I've, got, I've been making some really bad mistakes, some bad decisions in my life, so I'm the last person that should share with someone about Jesus. I'm not like the best version of Christianity. I, I, again, these are all things that, that we use. And for that reason, we say, this is good, I love it, but it's not something that I can share with somebody else. It's like food. Some of you cook. How many of you cook in here? Like you would say, I like to cook. How many of you would say, I should never ever cook? Because people will die. Yes. I am in that latter group. I wish I could cook. I, can't, I, I, I wish I could. But some of you, like you, you bake lasagna. And I had to learn that that's what it's called, baking. Baking lasagna. You bake lasagna and you give it to people. And again, nobody goes to the hospital. That's great. But if I baked lasagna, either the house burns down or your digestive system burns down. Because I should not be, I, that's good. I know there's lots of people out there that are good at it. I know there's lots of people in this church that are good at making lasagna. I'm not one of them. And we've had that same perspective towards sharing our faith. I know there's lots of people in this church that are probably great at sharing their faith. They're the professional Christians. They're like, they're like the, the super, like superhero Christians. I'm just a normal Christian. I'm, I've only been a Christian for a little bit of time. I don't know all the answers to the hard questions. I just, th that's not who I am. And for that question, is he shareable? This passage gives you, if that's you, an amazing answer. Take a look. Andrew Simon Peter's brother was one of the, these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Okay, so he was one of those two guys that was with John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, that guy is the Lamb of God. He's like, boom, I want to go get to know more about him. And then this happens immediately after. Verse 41, Andrew went to find his brother. Some translations say immediately went to find his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. And by the way, that's really important because some people, they think that Jesus' last name was Christ. As Jesus' last name wasn't Christ. His name was Jesus, and Christ was, is the title. I mean, it's the Messiah in Hebrew, the, the anointed one, the set-apart one, the one that the whole Old Testament has been like leading up to him. That's what Christ means. We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. How long has Andrew been a follower of Jesus? Yeah. There are kids in the nursery today who have followed Jesus longer than Andrew. There are kids in the nursery. Their experiential and intellectual understanding of Jesus is more robust than Andrew's, and yet Andrew had enough to share with Peter. Simon, who ultimately calls, calls, gets to be called Peter. And this is the amazing thing about that. Take a look at this. You start with John and go from John, who tells Andrew, who tells Peter. This is not a revival. There's not like thousands of people becoming Christians because this amazingly talented speaker was talking. People were like just turning to God right and left. It's one person at a time. And here's the amazing thing. We don't get a lot of airtime in the Bible with Andrew. He's kind of forgettable. Like if you ever felt like the middle child, that's Andrew. Andrew's just kind of like, yeah, I'm just kind of here. And I'm not, I'm not. That's Andrew. Peter, we get lots of airtime. In fact, he's one of the, the founding fathers of the church. He's one of the people, as much as he puts his foot in his mouth throughout the Bible, he's one of the key people that launches the church. We're here today in part because of Peter. But Peter would not have followed Jesus if it weren't for... What if Andrew never told him? What if Andrew was like, look, I, I believe in Jesus, but... I'm not really great. I'm not very convincing. I haven't known him long enough to really be confident enough to share. Have you ever tried to convince your sibling of something? I mean, forget about it. He didn't. He shares with one guy, his brother. And I believe that we're here today in part because of that. How amazing is that? Some of you have seen the movie um, Hacksaw Ridge. It's a movie starring Andrew Garfield, um, and it's describing a real-life event of an attack on Okinawa in, the world, in World War II, where U.S. forces come to this cliff, 
And when they get to the cliff, they've got to scale the, this cargo net up this sheer cliff, and then they get onto the battlefield. And right from the get-go, they get mowed down by machine gun fire and bombs and everything else. It's intense. And throughout the film, as they're going through and they're, they're battling one another, um, it becomes apparent that, that the U.S. forces are going to have to retreat. And so they do. They go ahead and they go right back to those cargo nets and they descend to safety. Everyone except for Desmond Doss. Desmond Doss is a real person and he was uh, like a conscientious objector. He didn't want to like uh, carry a machine gun, uh, but he basically was someone who, who went through anyway and decided that he wanted to be someone who was going to help people and help people live in a war, which is, seems counterintuitive, but that's what he did. In the midst of this battle, he decides, uh, as the, the forces are retreating, he looks and he sees all of these wounded soldiers who are still living. As guns are blazing past, when everyone else is going down the cargo nets, he turns around and realizes, I'm just going to go for one more. I'm going to try to get one person and get them on, uh, bring them back. And so he runs on back and he grabs one wounded soldier and he drags him. He's not a strong dude. Drags him back to the cargo net and starts to lower him down. And then he realizes, I didn't die. That's amazing. I've got time for just one more. He books it on back, finds the next wounded person, grabs them. Now, the first one was noble. Going back into that is heroic. He grabs the next person and he pulls him on back. And then he realizes, I didn't die. And then he says, and this is something that he actually said to himself, just one more. He goes back, brings that guy back just one more and he goes back he did that 75 times and 75 men are alive today because he when everyone else was retreating didn't but turned around and went right into fire and said look i don't know how long i've got to live but perhaps i've got enough life enough minutes for what like what if we had that perspective like just one more like, what if we, we thought, look, I don't have, I'm not an expert Christian. Again, I'm, I'm probably a novice or even a bad Christian. What if I shared just what I, what if I shared how much Andrew shared? Just what I know. I don't know everything, but I know what I know. And I share that. And then a good response is, yeah, but what if they've got a hard question? That gets us to the very next verse. The very next verse shows us what we see when we see Philip and uh, Nathaniel and the interaction with them. Verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathaniel. So again, we don't know who Nathaniel is. He's just like out of nowhere, but he's a buddy of, of Philip's. Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, we found the very person. We found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, son of Joseph, from where? Nazareth. And I love, I love Nathaniel's response. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Like they don't even have like two dollar generals in Nazareth. It is a one horse, poor plumbing, messed up. Like if you're going to have... Oh, the Messiah is coming from someplace. You don't say, oh yeah, Nazareth is where he came from. Nazareth is a forgettable, small, backwards community. And you're saying, I, I'm just saying right now, I'm skeptical. I doubt it. That's, that's just on the, on the sociological place. But, but Philip has, a, has a, there's even a deeper theological pushback that he has. Because hold on a second. The Bible, you talked about Moses and the prophets talking about the Messiah. There was a prophet that talked about the Messiah and that he was going to be born in a town. But that town's not Nazareth. You got your facts wrong. Where was the Messiah supposed to be born in? Bethlehem. So clearly, Philip, you're following the wrong dude. Now, Philip, I love that Philip is somebody that, could, I mean, it'd be amazing if Philip would have said, well, yeah, but I think that if we dig deeper, we're going to find out that he was born in Bethlehem, but he grew up in Nazareth. Like he was, he was born in Shanahan, but he grew up, he grew up in Manuka. I mean, that, that's like that kind of thing, right? But he doesn't say that. He doesn't know the answer. I don't know if you've ever looked for the perfect response to someone who asks you a hard question about your faith and you don't have it. But Philip gives it. 
Philip gives the perfect answer. And here it is. I don't know. I don't know. Come and see for yourself. I don't know the I mean, that, can anything, anything good come from Nazareth? Is it, is it theologically accurate saying that the, that the Messiah was not born in Bethlehem if I, as, as far as what we know right now, but he was born in Nazareth? Like, is this, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question, but I know this. Come and see for yourself. I love the fact that he doesn't know the answer, so he doesn't fake it. He just says, come with me and let's find out the answer together. If you're someone that is someone that is sharing your faith and you feel dead in the water because you're asked a hard question, don't be someone that's faking that. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't act like you're smarter than you are. Don't make them feel dumb for asking a good question. Simply say, oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. But come with me. Let's find out the answer together. Or I'm going to look into that. I'm going to get you a, 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 can I talk to you tomorrow at lunch? Or I'll text you an answer. If I go, I'm going to go study that. I'm going to talk with some people that I know that might have an answer. I'll text you an answer to that. But, but the cool thing is, is that we see within this, the shareability is even with people that we don't have the answer to. Now, I want you to take a look at this graph here. We have John the Baptist that shares the reality of Jesus with one person, with Andrew. And then Andrew shares that with Peter. We have Philip who hears about Jesus from Jesus, is following Jesus and shares that with Nathaniel. This is one at a time. Again, this is not a revival. This is just, just one more. Just one more. What if you put yourself on that? And what if like 2024, it was like, you were like, yeah, look, I, I don't know everything about everything. In fact, I know a lot about nothing. But I, I know that I, I've asked Jesus to forgive my sins. I've seen things in my life that speak to the credibility of what God's word says, that there is a God that created everything that he does love me, that sin has, has taken away my connection to him, my future with him, and that Jesus has come to give back that connection to him and a future with him and a present purpose that I, I could tell someone that. What if you, in 2024, you said, look, in the midst of all of the other things that I wanna see accomplished, I wanna, I wanna have like grade goals, I wanna have vocational goals. I want to have like a relational status goal. I want to have a weight loss goal. What if in the midst of all your other goals, you simply said, what if I just had this goal that I want to share with just one more? And I'm just going to share with you just one more. And I have that perspective as I go along. That is something I believe would be so impactful for each one of us. Is he for real? Is he shareable? And is he personal? Now, here's the thing. Some of you, how many of you uh, started, you, you're, you first heard about Jesus from a parent? Like is where you first heard about him. Not perfect presentation, maybe, but first heard, okay. How many of you, it was like a friend? It was someone that, that shared their faith with you, okay. How many of you, it was like you got invited to some like youth group or kids club or spy kids or something like that? Okay, yeah. All right, isn't that awesome how it's not just one? It's not like a one size fits all thing. This is what I, I love this about this next section here because when we look and we see how he communicated to Philip, Jesus says, come follow me. That's all it took. With Nathaniel, it took more. Jesus gets into this. As they approached, Jesus said, now, here's a, a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. I love that because Nathaniel's like, oh, you heard about me. Really? How did you know? Because I don't know you, but apparently my reputation has gotten around. And he says, how do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I love this. It's not that I heard from someone else. I saw you before you saw me. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Now he's telling, he's giving him props for being someone who's like got high integrity. He's a good guy. But he's also saying, I saw you when no one else saw you. We don't even know what that means. We don't know what Jesus is referring to. But Nathaniel did. Nathaniel's like, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. You being able to, to personally meet me and understand me in, a, in that way, understand things about me that no one else understood, lets me have confidence in you when I previously had skepticism. All this to say, if you have someone in your world that is not a follower of Jesus, he wants to meet them personally, and it might be different than how he met with you, how he connected with you. Be okay with that. Be cool with that. Be open to that. And, just be, and that's one of the reasons why we encourage people to like, hey, I want to just invite you to come to church with me. Because church is like this, like it's a broad, you know, it's like this buckshot of different, different types of ways that we're trying to communicate the same message that Jesus is the answer. And the, what, the things that connect with you might be different 
then, then how it connects with them. Be open to that. Is he for real? Is he shareable? Is he personal? And finally, is he yours? Is he yours? The thing that is so amazing about what we have with Jesus is that he does not desire for us to join a religion. He does not have a desire for us to become people that would just um, be out, like identify academically as someone who believes the Bible. He wants a relationship with us. My eldest son's name is Micah. It's a good name. If you're looking for names, if you're pregnant, Micah's a good name. Now, when, if you're having your firstborn, there's a lot of pressure to come up with a good name because you've never named anything but a pet up to this point. And hamsters, as cool as they are, different than a kid. And you don't want to tell your parents the names that you're thinking of because they have opinions. But when Julie and I were trying to figure out the name for our firstborn and that it was going to be a son, I thought, of, I thought it would be really cool if we named him Micah. There's this band called Five Iron Frenzy. The lead guitar player's name is Micah Ortega. Awesome. I love that band. They're hilarious. He's hilarious. Big dude. Plays electric guitar. Awesome. And I'm like, Micah would be a rat. So I told Julie, I said, I think we should name, I think we should name him Micah. And Julie said, oh, like the prophet from the Old Testament. <laughs> yes. Like the prophet from the Old Testament. Yes, like that. So eventually he's born, we name him Micah. And um, I, I saw the band um, after he was born. And I remember wanting to go up to Micah Ortega and say, dude, I named my son after you. And I'm like, how do you say that without sounding totally weird? And I realized there was no way. So I just did it anyway. And I walked on over and, I'm like, and he was on stage and I'm like, hey, Hey, Micah. Hey, M Micah. Micah. And so Micah takes his guitar off. And this is after they were done. It was like in the middle of the show. But he takes his guitar off and he puts it down and he comes on down and he actually walks down off the stage and he just like sits on the end of the stage and he's talking. I'm like, hey, man, I just want to tell you, I named, I named my son after you. I named my son Micah after you. And he's like, oh, that's so awesome. And he's like, and I said, would you mind like writing him something? And he said, sure. And he takes out this index card off the stage. And he was just like, he said, dear Micah, and blah, 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 blah. He like just wrote him this cool thing. And I was just like, how awesome is it that this guy, he didn't have to give me any time. He could have just said, he said, oh yeah, sure. Uh, hey, Micah, better name than Charles. Or, you know, whatever. But he did that. He, he actually took the, and I was like, so like, have you ever met a celebrity and felt like they actually looked at you? Like, they saw me. Like, I exist in the universe of their understanding let alone this guy who came off the stage and actually spent time with him and actually wrote something to my kid. Like, that was huge. That feeling that we have with celebrity, I believe the reason that that stokes us up so much is because inside of all of us, we have a desire to be connected to something great, and we know that a lot of us never will be. And so those few moments, we feel so stoked. But let me just encourage you with this. The message of John is a message that God didn't simply make time for you that we have God just not stepping off of a stage or putting his guitar down. We have the reality that God came from heaven to earth, that he became human, that he died, that he rose to get you and me back based on what he did for us, not what we could do for him. And as amazing as it is to feel a celebrity give you five minutes of attention, you have the king of the universe who gave you his life. Is he yours? Like personally, not just academically, not just possibly. Is he yours? With all of the questions, with the doubts, with the things that I'm still working out in my faith, is he yours? My hope is that 2024 is a year we step in hard, that we come back week after week as we get into this book and we find out Jesus in everyday life is someone that I want to be like. I want, I want him to be my leader, my savior. I don't want to be a fan of Jesus. I want to be a follower. And he could be yours. And so here's how I want us to do that, just in closing. 
We've got, um, next week we're gonna have these um, out. We're gonna have a handful of them available to purchase. They're like five bucks. If you can find them cheaper online, do it. Um, but this is basically a, a copy of the Book of John and the translation that we're preaching through. And on every page, it's got the text and on the opposite side, it's got um, journal. So you could basically bring this to service. You could write down notes, but we want you to be like in the Bible throughout the week. And so whether you buy one of those or don't with your own Bible, you can pick one of these up for free today, just on your way out, snag one of these. This is a reading plan to take you through the book of John that we're going through. That's gonna be tracking with us as we're in the series. And the cool thing is that each one of these verses, like each one of these this is like four days per week. So it's not the full thing because we know that life gets crazy sometimes, but we want you to, and even if you're reading something else, we want you to read this section. And like, so like the first day is John 1, 1 to 18. I am the slowest reader in America. And I read that section in 75 seconds. You've got 75 seconds. What if when we, we allow each day to be bathed in just like, bite-sized chunks of understanding the life of Jesus so we understand more of Jesus so that we see ourselves becoming more Jesus. And if you're someone that's agnostic or atheist and you're like, I'm just investigating this Jesus, you're gonna get a chance to do at a slow roll so that you get a lot of questions to ask that we can be able to come alongside one another and answer together. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if 2024 was that type of year where we actually took those types of steps together where, where we get to Easter, and by the time we're like celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, we feel like we've actually walked with Jesus. That's my heart for you, church. I would love to see that happen. Amen? Let's do that. Let's step into that. Let's step into that today. Let's stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the fact that all of us in this room, no matter what we've uh, had as a year leading up to this moment, no matter what this last week has been like, the thing we have in common is that we are broken people that are desperately loved by you. We're fallible, we have issues. For every reason that others might kick us to the curb or we'd even wanna give up on ourselves, you don't. We thank you for that gospel. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room that has been just walking that line of wondering if they wanna go all in and put their trust in you. I pray that they do that today that they put their confidence in you, that they follow you, that, that they do so with all of their heart and mind. That they have more of it than just an emotional experience, but that they intellectually understand that you are calling them into a very real life based on very real forgiveness that you accomplished historically that we can experience today. Lord, I pray that you help launch each of us out of here with the joy that comes from being connected to you and the life that's worth sharing with the people in our world that don't yet know you. Not as experts, but as witnesses. I will give you the thanks for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. If you want prayer, our prayer partners are gonna be right up front. If you're new to the church or wanna just check in and say hi, I'll be in the fireside room. See you there.